this party started! <laughs> we got a park party happening here. Are we starting right now? All right. So good morning, everyone. So all of y'all stayed in, in the back of me. You're making me nervous. Can you stand out here so I can see you? Are we good? Good morning, everybody. Good morning. My name is Bertha Lewis, and I will be your MC today. So we are really happy that everybody came here. This event is being put on by the Echo Friendly Parks for All. It is a citywide coalition um, of really environmentalist and folks who not only want to protect the environment, but specifically want to protect the parks in our community. So to start us off this morning, our first speaker is Jennifer Greenfeld, who's the New York City the, uh, Parks Department. She's the Deputy Commissioner for Environment and Planning. Now, she might not look at it, look like it, because she's really good looking, but she's had over 30 years of experience in the field of natural resource management. She's overseen natural areas, green infrastructure, and forestry work throughout New York City. Ladies and gentlemen, Jennifer Greenfeld, Deputy Commissioner. Thank you so much. When you get look up, up close, you'll, you'll see the years. Um, and plus, it's just my stature. Anyway, thank you so much. Thank you to Bertha Lewis, Jay Feldman, Chip Osborne, Jeff Fritz, everybody in the coalition. This pilot and our partnership is an inspiring opportunity for us to build on Parks' commitment to managing our landscapes without the unnecessary use of synthetic chemicals. And we at New York City Parks are reducing the use of chemicals. In fact, we've reduced the use of glyphosate, which is that main ingredient in Roundup, by 98% since wow. 2014. Woo! So we're really proud of that, but there's always more to learn, and we're looking forward to doing just that from this pilot. We know their new best practices, and we really want to understand what they are and understand the resources required to implement them. And it does require resources, so I want to thank our maintenance and operations folks for their commitment and hard work, and bear with me, because we're doing this pilot in every borough, including in the Bronx, uh, Deputy Chief Minerva Del Real and Chief Schoons, in Brooklyn, uh, Deputy Woo. Chief Jamie Hewitt and Hort Manager Roderick Phillips. In Queens, Rufus King Park, DC Deputy Chief Adriana Yachikiewicz, Court Manager Keen Ang. In uh, Staten Island, Chief Russo, Horticultural Manager Yvette Castro, Gardener Emily Stringer, and of course, our crew in Manhattan, led by our Horticulture Manager Mercedes Nunez. Matt Genrich is here from, uh, with us, and Ben Shoop. So it's just an amazing team and it takes a lot of people and we're really happy to be partnering. Um, and I just want to mention that this pilot focuses on one element of the landscape, on turf, which of course is important, but it's just one of many ways that New York City Parks supports the well-being of our natural ecosystems in New York City, which of course translates into healthier New Yorkers, which is something we all want. We have a wide range of initiatives to promote biodiversity and horticulture and conservation. And I'll just mention two that I'm really proud of. I'm proud of everything, but you can't talk about all, everything. Um, we have 17 of these new gardens called pollinator places where we're using native plants in, a, in an area that's really obvious and, and approachable for New Yorkers. They're not hidden away in corners. Um, and we also have this amazing place on Staten Island, the Greenbelt Native Plant Center that collects native seed stores them for future use and that's what we use to grow out our plants for our restoration and our horticulture activities. 
So we're grateful to all of our partners. I need to give a shout out to my um, colleague, Matt Drury, who couldn't be with us today. And of course, my best wishes from our commissioner, Sue Donahue, um, and all of our partners across the city for the progress we've made, protecting our natural resources and maintaining safe and clean and beautiful public spaces for all New Yorkers. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. So we got a muckety muck from the Parks Department which shows you we're not just like, you know, green radicals. We actually got the Parks Department that's working with us. I want everybody to turn around and give a hand to Ben Osborne. He's the Assistant Commissioner for Horticulture and Forestry. Here, thank you. All right, yeah. And his crew. And shoot. Oh, oh. And thank you to Matt, too, Matt Genrich, our manager, and uh, uh, Xavier, and Devon. Thank you, guys. So, another person that is very integral to parks. You know, we have our small coalition, the Black Institute, Beyond Pesticides. Mount Sinai, Stony Phil. Um, however, there are groups of people that work all year long to make sure that our parks are good for us. And we have one of those representatives here today. So let's have a, a round of applause for Sharice Palomino, New Yorkers for Parks. Thank you. Good morning, my name is Cherise Palomino, and I'm the Director of Advocacy and Programs at New Yorkers for Parks. We are a founding member of the Playfair Coalition, which includes over 400 parks organizations from across the city. Thank you to the Black Institute for organizing today's events, championing eco-friendly parks for all. The city's decade-long divestment in parks continues to exacerbate inequalities in our park system. The city council and the mayor can fix this by making the 1% investment of the city budget into parks. In FY22, the NYPD overtime amounted to $670 million, while the park spending budget during the same period of time was $618 million. It is imperative that we champion increased funding for our park system. Many parks advocates and community leaders invest their time volunteering to do cho jobs that the New York City Parks Department has not been adequately funded to do. New York is the greatest city in the world. With a park system that is outdated, nor has the proper infrastructure to support the climate crisis we're living in. Sorry. This climate crisis has highlighted the critical needs of our park system, including the need for adequate funding for park staffing to do resiliency work and to address inequalities in access, infrastructure, and general maintenance. Investing in our parks is critical to mitigating stormwater and other challenges brought on by extreme weather events. Instead, many of our parks are flooded during mild rainstorms. We are overdue for transformative investment in our park system. 1% of the city budget could improve maintenance in parks like Morningside Park. We need parks that are well maintained and equitably serving New Yorkers of all communities and backgrounds. The New York City Parks Department does a valiant job maintaining these aging resources but needs more funding to do so. It is time to allocate 1% of the city budget to parks. Thank you. A 1% solution. All right, so one of our partners in this whole coalition, you will see their uh, table over here, is from Mount Sinai, the Icon uh, School of Medicine. And we have an assistant professor of environmental medicine, public health. If we have decent parks, that don't poison us, we will be healthy. 
So Sarah Evans conducts research on how environmental exposures impact children's health and she works with communities to advocate for practices and policies that create safer environments for all children. Ladies and gentlemen, Sarah Evans from Mount Sinai. Thank you so much, Bertha, for not calling me a mucky muck. Um, so good morning. I'm so happy to be here today speaking on behalf of the Children's Environmental Health Center at the ICANN School of Medicine at Mount Sinai. We're a team of pediatricians and scientists who celebrate pesticide-free parks as a true victory for public health in New York City. Oops, sorry about that. Not used to using my phone to speak. So access to green spaces is an essential part of a healthy childhood. Yet children's natural propensity to put their hands in their mouths, to dig in the dirt, and to roll around in the grass makes them especially vulnerable to the harmful effects of pesticides. They also breathe more air than adults, making them more susceptible to inhaling chemicals. But now, with the implementation of pesticide-free parks in New York City, families will no longer have to worry that going to the park will expose their children to chemicals linked to a long list of health problems, including nervous system toxicity, cancers, hormone disruption, asthma, and more. Organically maintained parks not only provide a safe and healthy environment for children to play and grow, they help to mitigate the myriad health effects that are associated with climate change by reducing the use of fossil fuel dependent products and creating healthy soil. Organic parks are particularly important in environmental justice and communities of color that bear a disproportionate burden of pesticide exposures and the health impacts of climate change and associated health inequities. The creation of pesticide-free parks has far-reaching effects on protecting the health of our most vulnerable New Yorkers. Pesticide-free parks are also a public health victory for city workers. Pesticide applicators are at higher risk of certain cancers, as well as heart disease and stroke, outcomes that have been linked to use of pesticides on the job. For many years, our Mount Sinai faculty have counseled communities across the state and the U.S. on reducing the use of synthetic pesticides. Too often, municipalities respond that it's impossible, it simply cannot be done. But as you can see under your feet here today, it is possible. And I can't wait to respond to those municipalities by saying New York City did it and you can too. So I just want to thank the City of New York, the Parks Department, and all the advocates that worked tirelessly to make this a possibility. Thank you. I just want to acknowledge a couple more of my friends that are here. Allie Feldman. Where's Allie? Yes! And, and Allie's getting ready to have a, another like eco-friendly park baby in August uh, to help us grow our ranks. She is um, voters for animal rights because when you come to the park, you come with your little pets, right? Put your babies down, put your dogs, cats, gerbils, kangaroos, everything in, in the park. And I want to also acknowledge back there Brent, Brad Taylor, who's the Friends of Morningside Park. Thank you, Brad. Thank you for choosing Morningside. Now, you can have a coalition, and you can fight, and you can do whatever you want to do. And you can say, do this, do that. This is right. That is right. Um, I'm from the Black Institute. We wrote a report called Poison Parks, and it might have seemed very dramatic at the time, but we concentrate on black and brown communities, and what we knew was that all of these pesticides, glyphosate, just poison was being sprayed in our parks, and people didn't know it, and they were mostly in the low-income communities of color. But you know, for all the marching around and all the organization that you do, you got to have a champion in the legislature to actually pass a bill and make it happen. And ladies and gentlemen, our champion in the last city council was former council member uh, Ben Kalos. Now, he served from 2014 to 2021. He was the sponsor of the bill that we call Intro 1524. It actually brought New York City 
into the modern area of parks and playgrounds, recognizing the hazards of pesticides and the viability and benefits of organic land management to protect our health and our environment. Ladies and gentlemen, Eco-Friendly Parks Coalition champion, Mr. Ben Kalos. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, I'm council member, former council member Ben Kalos. I represented the Upper East Side in the city council from 2014 to 2021 where if you haven't introduced a law by first grade, you might be considered an underachiever. Uh, today, I'm here to read a report about what I learned in kindergarten. Everything I learned about pesticides in kindergarten by Ben Kalos. One morning, nearly 10 years ago in 2014, I visited PS290 to keep a campaign promise to visit every public school. There, I met Paula Rogovin and the precocious group of five-year-olds in her kindergarten class. The children taught me about toxic pesticides. They taught me about nature's pesticides, like ladybugs, and they chanted, ban toxic pesticides, use only nature's pesticides, pass a law. So I invited them to City Hall, where once again they taught me more about toxic pesticides and more about nature's pesticides like stinky marigolds. And they once again chanted, ban toxic pesticides, use only nature's pesticides, pass a law. We spent a year fighting City Hall to draft a bill, and when the World Health Organization which at the time City Hall said didn't matter, classified glyphosate, the active ingredient in Roundup, as a likely carcinogen, we were finally given the legislation. So we came back to the now first graders in 2015 to announce the new legislation in their schoolyard with news cameras everywhere as the children once again chanted, ban toxic pesticides, use only nature's pesticides, pass a law, but we couldn't get a hearing. Paula, parents, and adults stepped in to help the children. Jay Feldman, director of Beyond Pesticides, Patty and Doug Wood, founders of Grassroots Environmental Education, Sarah Evans from Department of Environmental Medicine and Public Health at Mount Sinai, who you just heard from, and so many others. These adults were relentless calling council members until we had enough sponsors to have our first hearing in 2017, and boy, did we. More than 100 kindergartners and third through third graders filled the city hall chambers. The sergeants at arms didn't know what to do with 100 kids taking over the chamber floor chanting, ban toxic pesticides, use only nature's pesticides, pass a law. While we couldn't get it done in my first term, we came back even stronger in my second term with an even stronger bill and an even stronger coalition that now included the Black Institute led by the Bertha Lewis, along with Reverend Billy and the Church of Stop Shopping, as well as my new legislative director, Wilfredo Lopez. When we talked about pesticides, I think people thought of weeds in lush, parks in wealthy neighborhoods, not the often blacktop parks found in low-income communities of color. Research from the Black Institute found that parks on the Upper East Side, like Carl Scherz Park on 90th Street, saw few, if any, sprays of these pesticides, while parks in East Harlem, just six blocks north, saw exponentially more sprays of toxic, cancer-causing pesticides. These blacktops were getting drenched in pesticides to stop weeds from growing through asphalt and in the process, poisoning our parks. With everyone's effort, the children, the teachers, the adults, and the civil rights activists like Bertha Lewis, we were able to gain enough sponsors in 2019, force a hearing in 2020, and we passed the law on Earth Day in 2021. Now, the, 
thankfully the story doesn't end there because the New York City Charter and Administrative Code have hundreds, if not thousands of laws that have been passed and have been ignored from day one. But in comes Council Member Darlene Mealy again, my friend, I used to get to sit next to her and we are lucky to have her back. And so she started asking a lot of questions about what happened with this and what's happening in her own neighborhood, which she represents in Brooklyn. And you'll hear more about what will be happening there. And this coalition did not stop fighting. And I wanna thank the Parks Department, Commissioner Sue Donahue and her representative here today uh, to announce and share that they are now moving forward with this law, piloting in eight parks throughout the five boroughs, including right here in Morningside Park. That is huge. Everyone deserves a round of applause. Thank you very much for having me. All I did was carry the legislation. This would not have happened with this amazing coalition that you see. And uh, what we will get for this, when I started this, I had just been, uh, I was a newlywed. I now have a five-year-old. But uh, what we will get for this is parks where we can let our children play and our animals play safely. And I think it's worth it. Thank you. So as he just mentioned, uh, another one of our champions on the city council, um, you know, we're here in Manhattan, but we've got five boroughs. And this park that we're in today is one demonstration project. However, we're gonna do another one over there in Brooklyn. And the council member representing a voice for working families, seniors and youth, and all members of her community. And that is a staunch, staunch supporter of this coalition and parks is current council member Darlene Mealy. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. This is a great day at Morningside Park. I am so proud to be here to support the Black Institute and the Echo Friendly Parks for All. Let's give yourselves a hand. This is very phenomenal. Um, a coalition that at, at the first organic land use disposition process project here in New York City. Intro 1524 was such an important piece of legislation to ensure that our families can enjoy sitting in the park without having their health issues at risk. When I walked in, there was a young child playing on the grass. Imagine if pesticides was all in this grass right now. We do not know, and the parents didn't know, so I am so glad for all these organizations to stepping up and saying, not in our parks, right? Not in our parks. That's what we have to continue saying all over, and I'm looking forward to doing it in my park in the 41st Councilmatic District, Lincoln Terrace Park. Woo! That will be the next one, I hope, Ms. Bertha Lewis. Um, uh oh, Jennifer, anyone. <laughs> Events such as this, these are so important, especially in communities of color, like here in Harlem or in Brooklyn, Lincoln Terrace Park. We had a hearing, the last hearing, and I thank the Parks Department for stepping up just as well. I asked them those strong questions. Why are you using pesticides? I thought that we were not, and, and the commissioner still let us know they are. They are. So I'm looking forward to eco-friendly parks all over this nation. And we're gonna keep our parks department accountable to all our elected uh, parks. And I thank Bertha Lewis, I thank all the advocates here today um, Black Institute, Echo Friendly Parks for All, and everyone attending this important hearing. I want to thank, you got to give our former council member, Ben Kalos, a round of applause. Big round of applause. For knowing that the children will lead the way. And he did something about it. And I'm Councilwoman Darlene Mealy of the 41st Councilmatic District in Brooklyn. Thank you. All right.
So, you know, a, a lot of times what the Black Institute had to do, we had to go out and tell people this. You know, because they didn't know. They didn't have homes in the Hamptons or like, you know, Jeff Bezos mansions where you could just, you know, lay out and do whatever you want. You know, our folks come to the park. This is Harlem. And Morningside Park was a prime example. So I want to introduce to you someone who had been part of the Exonerated Five who lives in this district and who has been working tirelessly on criminal justice reform. But it is criminal when you poison our parks. Ladies and gentlemen, Yusuf Salam. Peace and blessings, family. You know, what I've been hearing about what's going on, we should have had eco-friendly parks decades ago. The fact that in our community, a community that I was born and raised in, as you know, I'm one of the formerly known members of the Central Park Five, and we're now known as the Exonerated Five. But what's more important than that is that I have 10 children. I have 10 children. And having 10 children, I always came to the parks. I didn't always go to Central Park because of course for me that was the scene of the crime. So I didn't want to go there, but I wanted to be able to take my children to places and spaces that were open and natural and clean. Imagine my surprise that when I found out that they were poisoning our parks. And so when I heard about what was going on here, when I heard what we needed to have happen, I said, you know what, I gotta stand with y'all to be counted amongst those who have to be counted. Great things are happening here. As I always say, it's happening in Harlem. Harlem is known worldwide. And the beautiful thing is that this is the place that we call home and that we want to make sure that if we can do it in our places in the most greenest of spaces, and we don't have a lot of them, we need more green spaces, but we need to make sure that our green spaces are not poisoned because why are they poisoning us? It's almost like they believe that we're expendable. But we got to know that we are worth something and that we were born on purpose. And that's one of the main messages that I give my children all the time. It's not what happens to you, but how you internalize everything that allows you to come out on the other side of the storm, a person that gets, to, gets a chance to reflect the light. And so I'm glad to be here. I'm glad that Ms. Lewis called me to participate. And I'm glad that I was able to participate. You know, I have a global platform. Everybody knows about the Central Park Jogger case. Everybody knows about the Exonerated Five. And so I love to use my person and the platform I have to be able to speak truth to power and make sure that we can keep going forward. And I kind of just want to echo what the former councilman said, because I loved it. I mean, this is powerful. Ban toxic pesticides. Use only nature's pesticides. Pass a law. But we need those laws to be replicated, to be rolled out all around our great city. We can be the green beacon, I think so that the whole nation gets an opportunity to live in harmony with nature in a beautiful way. So thank you, Bertha. Thank you for the Black Institute, what we're doing here. I, much, I appreciate you. Thank you. Appreciate you. All right. 10 children. He been busy. <laughs> I just also want to acknowledge Jay Wright. Um, I'll let everybody see you. You know, you come to an event, then you know, act like you don't want to be seen. And Jay Wright is part of the staff for a, a longtime resident up here, Inez Dickens. She couldn't be here today because she's making laws up in Albany. One of our main uh, folks here um, from Beyond Pesticides, and I just want to make sure that you all know, if you come to the Black Institute table, we have a QR code that you can take a picture of we have uh, just finished our follow-up to Poison Parks, and we took it from you, Jay. It's called Beyond Poison Parks. So 
I want to introduce to you all Jay Feldman. He is the founder and director of the National Environmental and Public Health Membership Group called Beyond Pesticides. He has a 40-year career of working with communities nationwide. He's coordinating the collaboration of New York City Parks to manage eight organic management demonstration sites in all five boroughs. Ladies and gentlemen, Jay Feldman. Thank you, Ms. Lewis. Thank you so much. Well, you've, you've got the background here on the sort of melding of science, policy, and action. You heard from Ben Kalis on the policy side, but that was driven by the science that Mount Sinai brought to, to the discussion. And now you're seeing the action part. And Beyond Pesticides uh, has been honored to be a part of this process, bringing the community together around an understanding that we can manage our landscapes without dependency on petrochemical pesticides. pesticides and fertilizers. The key, and why that's important, is because the issues around land management intersect with three existential crises that we as a community and as a, as a nation are really called upon to address. And that includes health issues, a range of health issues, from cancer to respiratory issues. It includes biological or biodiversity collapse, which is on the horizon, and it includes the climate crisis. And one way we can do this in terms of one way we can make a difference is to eliminate petrochemical pesticides and fertilizers, which we're doing on this site here at Morningside and in the eight, well, seven other sites across the city. So what are we doing about this? You've heard the, the sort of outline of why this is important and where it's going on. So what is going on? What exactly are we doing? Well, we came down to Morningside Park and the seven other sites across the boroughs, and we took soil samples. Because, as Ben said, we want to work with nature and really harness the, the sort of relationship that we have with nature to cycle nutrients naturally, create plant resiliency, and adaptability to drought and increase water retention. So we're essentially creating an ecosystem here that gets off this dependency cycle and ends up with a beautification program that is healthy for people and pets. So we're talking pollinators to pets and wildlife to waterways. Protection of children, protection of those with underlying health conditions, protection of the environment. These are concepts that we all care about. We're taking the concept of, we're taking the concept of sustainability and we're putting a definition to it a definition that has a plan, that has steps that can be taken that are no longer reliant on toxic chemicals. To do that, we have created this, co this collaboration with the New York City Parks Department and have found an incredibly capable staff uh, at the New York City Parks Department that is extremely enthusiastic about uh, managing this site and the other, other boroughs in which we intend to create a model that's applicable across the city. We brought in uh, Osborne Organics, you're going to be hearing from Chip Osborne, president of Osborne Organics, to help with the technical side of collaboration with the staff, with the New York City Parks Department. This would not have happened without the underwriting of Stonyfield Organic, and now we have a new partner in Stop and Shop, uh, which is committed to the Staten Island projects. Um, it takes a community, it takes a village to do a project like this. It takes an understanding, an awareness, and a commitment, and it takes resources. So we've got the, 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 the resources we need to move this program ahead. Uh, you can see the checks over there that have been written. Um, and now we're putting our metal to the pedal, and we're moving ahead. It's not business as usual. We are addressing the urgency. We're incorporating this program into the the goals of New York City to be a sustainable community. We're integrating compost into the program, which is a cutting edge feature of this program through the sanitation department. We will be taking that compost and putting it back in as a nutrient source and a source of soil biology and soil health for these sites. And that's no small feat. Uh, more about that later. We have actually done testing of the compost and we believe and we're certain it can be used 
Um, so we're, we're in a situation here where we're creating a closed loop and one that is going to lead the nation, lead the nation in transitioning our playing fields, our parks, our open spaces to organic land management. So thank you so much for being here. Okay. We are leading the nation, people all across this country. New York City leads the way. So you gotta have experts, right? Who is our resident expert? The president of, of Osborne Organics, 40 years of experience, works in communities across the country to transition parks and playing fields to real organic land management. Mr. Osborne himself has served for many years as the elected chair of his parks commission in his hometown of Marblehead, Massachusetts. Ladies and gentlemen, our expert, our scientist, our Mr. Organics, Chip Osborne. Thank you, Ms. Lewis. So I'm going to tell you a little bit from the technical side what organic land care is all about and what we're doing here. What you're seeing here at Morningside, Ben and his staff started last fall, started with simple grass seed and an aerator little bit of water with rain over the winter and we produced some results right away. So there's certain elements to organic land care and what we are not is a product swap. We're not simply taking out something that's a bad product and replacing it with one that we deem is better. We're now approaching this part and all of our projects as a system. So the system is everything that you see above ground but most importantly everything that you don't see below ground. And that's the focus that Jay talked about. We are science-based. This is not just pie in the sky organic because we think it's a good thing to do. This is every bit as science-based as a conventional approach. And we deal with it that way and that is the foundation for all of our work. So how do we do this? What did we do here? First step was a site evaluation. And we walked and we looked at the strengths and weaknesses of this site and determine what strategies we think might work to begin to transform this into a natural environment. We did an extensive soil evaluation for the texture, the sand, silt and clay, the chemistry, and most importantly, samples of this soil went under a microscope and all those little organisms under there were identified and what they're doing and how they're working. Our focus is primarily on soil biological life cultural practices and natural organic product. We use no synthetics. Now the focus is pesticide free parts, but it also needs to be synthetic fertilizer free parts. There's no place in natural land management or any land management for water soluble synthetic fertilizers or even those water insoluble synthetics. It needs to be natural organic because those fertilizers feed the organisms. We're after nutrient cycling. Think of that bacteria that you learned about in school, a single cell, and it breaks down that organic fertilizer. And then a higher level organism, a protozoa, comes along and eats that bacteria. And what do we have as the end result? Nitrogen. We don't need to get it out of a synthetic bag. We're looking to build and rebuild soil structure. The soil structure leads to the water savings that Jay talked about. Within five years of a program like this, we should see a 35% reduction in water use. And that's typically what we see in projects around the country. We're looking to set the table for the future. This will be a three-year transition project where we introduce new practices, new products, new protocols, and then build for the longer term. Uh, in all of my uh, dealings so far with the district here, and particularly with Ben, it's an extremely knowledgeable staff. It's really exciting to work with them. And what we're going to do is go through a training program of sorts, where even though they're quite educated in what they do, we're going to begin to introduce these new products and protocols and the science and education behind what we're doing. So at New York has 
the ability to lead the nation in this. It's happening in other parts of the country. But with the, with the stature that New York City possesses and taking a leadership role, what we all want to see is this to spread around the country. Thank you. Thank you, Chip. So watch out, America. We're coming to a park near you. Now, again, in our coalition, you can do nothing without folks on the ground and grassroots. And our next speaker is the Executive Director of Environmental Health, a nonprofit called Grassroots Environmental Education. They inform the public and the decision makers about the health and the risk of environmental exposures. Ladies and gentlemen, Ms. Patty Wood. Thank you, Bertha. Okay, from our perspective, this is a truly exciting moment. New York City is now the largest city in the country to, to, be, to bestow upon its residents and future generations of New Yorkers a pesticide-free parkland. Places where people, pets, and wildlife will share healthy, safe, green spaces amidst the skyscrapers and cityscapes. Connecting to nature with your family, watching birds, walking your dog, will not be spoiled by pesticide application warning flags. It was an amazing effort by so many, and we are really honored to have played a role. As an environmental health nonprofit, the very first issue we focused on to is eliminate pesticides from schools, daycares, and neighborhoods. After several months working on this, we were able to convince legislators in Albany to sponsor a law banning pesticides from school grounds across this state. This became a reality in 2010, but New York City's children did not benefit from this law as they do not have school fields and playing grounds, but instead play on New York City parks. This law that we are celebrating here today was passed on Earth Day in 2021 and went into effect on November 22nd, 2022. And it fixes that injustice. Now New York City's children will play on pesticide-free parks and fields going forward. Thank you especially to the bill's sponsor, former City Councilman Ben Kalos, and the entire City Council who voted unanimously to pass this law. While children's health is paramount to our work, this law also heeds the call to eliminate toxic chemicals from entering the environment. As a city surrounded by water, New York has the responsibility to protect this critical natural resource and its ecosystems that are found in and around it. Runoff from severe weather will no longer be laced with turf pesticide poisons that have compromised the efforts of groups who are seeding oysters to revive protective shellfish beds and planting protective grasses to minimize the effects of storm surges and flooding. And as New York City makes efforts toward becoming more sustainable, abandoning the use of fossil fuel-based pesticides is a major step forward. When pesticides are made, three major greenhouse gases are emitted, carbon dioxide, methane, and nitrous oxide. And when used, they increase ground level ozone. Finally, I want to especially recognize our friend and colleague for many years, Chip Osborne, who you just heard from, for his invaluable experience and deep knowledge of natural turf management and his wonderful, really wonderful ability to share this with others, and in this case, New York City Parks personnel. We all know that laws have no teeth without good implementation and enforcement, and we are grateful to have CHIP as well as the continuing support of the city and the dedication of the members of the Eco-Friendly Parks for All. Thank you. Okay, don't get weary. We only have two more speakers. One person, that I do want to really recognize. When you heard about those kindergarten folks, who is the one that goes into New York City elementary schools? She has taught in these schools for over 44 years. And then she retired and decided to be like some kind of activist and hook up. And, 
and, and be uh, a cornerstone of the eco-friendly parks for all. She's authored, she's authored four books, all with a view to teach children how to do social activism. She co-founded Educators Against Racism and Apartheid, the TNET Peace and Justice Visual, and Don't Gas the Meadowlands Coalition. The pesticide law that we celebrated was introduced by, Paul, by Ben Kalos. Kindergarten children, now they're in ninth grade. She will not only tell you about her work, this is a dedicated person. The children are our future, and ladies and gentlemen, Paul Aragovin actually trusts with our children. Paula. It's so great to be here. It's so great. We're, we're all so happy. This was a team of people working together. I wanted so much for my former kindergarten kids from 2013-14 to be here. But you know what? They all had, they're in ninth grade now, and they all have exams. So um, one of the students sent me a note last night, Savannah Basin, sent this note. Thank you. I'm speechless and proud to have participated so young in the process. Let me just tell you a little bit about uh, my kindergarten class and the fight to get this law. We were learning in 2013-14, we were doing research about foods in our school cafeteria, and they wanted to learn about tomatoes. So we made a whole list of the questions they had, what they wanted to, to learn, and in the process of learning that, they learned about aphids and other insect pests that, that annoy, that, that eat up the tomato plants. Um, and we learned about uh, the impacts of uh, these pests and uh, weeds on uh, farms. And the children kept doing more research. I, and we figured, well, what could we do? And we said, well, let's get rid of the pests. And we pretended, we like to role play, pretended to spray something called pesticides. Pretended to do it. And, and during the role play, I instructed the kids to be scratching their rashes on their arms and legs and coughing and things that happened to farm workers over many, 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 many decades. Um, when the children looked, they were very upset. So when they learn that the pesticides are used in parks also, in parks right here in their city, they were so upset. They were so upset. And I really believe it's wrong to leave children upset. And I have some former colleagues and, and parents and even a former student here, Lucy, uh, they know that I don't believe when we studied about child labor, we did something about it. When we learned about pesticides, we made a list. What could we do about it? And so we, we kept doing our research, and then we kept doing those many things on our list. We wrote a play, and some of the words in the play were ban toxic pesticides. pesticides. Oh, Use only oh, nature's oh, pesticides. So, oh, that's a law. Law. That's, yeah. <laughs> so um, when we interviewed some of the grandparents, Jerry and Iris Balsam, they live in Long Island, and they had been fighting for a pesticide law. And the kids asked them, well, what did you do? Well, we talked to the lawmakers. Did that work? No. We wrote to the lawmakers. Did that work? Nah. And then they kids said, well, so what did you do next? And they said, well, we marched. And so we got up, made, held pretend signs, and we marched throughout our classroom and, uh, and chanting what those grandparents taught us. Ban toxic pesticides. Use only nature's pesticides. Pass a law. So we, during that time, we also learned about um, alternatives to toxic pesticides because you have to solve the problem somehow. So when Councilmember Ben Kalos came to our school, the children told him about the research, he invited them to City Hall, and he looked at them like, seriously, I'm going to do it to you. This is what he did to them. He said, what would you like me to do? And they started chanting, 
ban toxic pesticides, use only nature's pesticides, pass a law. And so he said, I promise I'll try. And he told you the next year after World Health Organization made a declaration that uh, glyphosate is uh, likely carcinogen, they were able to introduce the law. It was tough. And it was the people here who, and, and others who work so hard, I'm telling you, day and night, day and night, trying to get this law passed. It was so tough. I won't tell you all the obstacles, but there were many, many, many. Um, and, you know, Ben told us how we, told you how we went to, to City Hall by subway and, and did a skit as our testimony, 60 kids and 60 uh, adults. And, um, it, it was really, really hard work to get this passed. And on Earth Day 2021, we had a press conference announced that the bill was going to be passed. It was passed that day unanimously. And this, is, this law is about environmental justice, not just about making nice parks, clean parks, healthy parks, but it's about environmental justice about parks for all children, regardless of race, of economics. So the message for young people and for people of all ages, you are never too young or too old to pass a law. You're never too young or too old to help make this a better world. And I want to thank all of the people who were involved and, and all of the, and it's true, you, a law doesn't mean anything unless it's implemented. So we urge all of you, all of us, to stay involved and make sure this law is fully implemented. Thank you. You're never too young. Kindergarten students did this. And we're all here today because of little kids in kindergarten and now they're getting ready to go into high school. Our last speaker, is one of our like you know every building has a keystone well the keystone of this coalition is our sustainable agricultural manager for stony field organic they got the cow they got yoga it's it's free by the way so so you all can get some so make sure that you do our next speaker prior to coming to stony field she managed environmental education, urban farms, and food access for Brooklyn's Botanic Garden. Woo, Brooklyn! I live in Brooklyn, that's why. And she worked on fruits and vegetables to grow New York City. Our next speaker to round us all out from Stonyfield Organic, Ms. Dana Osborne. Dana! Thank you, Ms. Lewis. Um, my name is Dana Bourne, not to take any of the Osborne credit. Um, and I'm sustainable agriculture, sustainable agriculture manager for Stonyfield Organic. Um, and I'm truly honored and inspired to be here today, jumping in, um, jumping into this coalition um, with the city of New York um, to announce the eight parks that will be transitioning to organic maintenance serving as demonstration sites for the rest of the city. Stonyfield is the leading organic yogurt maker in the country, and we were founded on a belief that organic is a win-win for all, better for people and better for the planet. In 2018, we launched the Stony Fields program to convert parks and playing fields across the country to organic grounds maintenance management to bring our passion from the farms to the fields where children and families play. To date, along with our partners, we've worked with over 40 communities to transition parks, and we're just getting started. We're dedicated to making as many parks and fields as safe and healthy as they can be today and in the years to come. When the Stony Fields program began, we dreamed of one day working with New York City, one of the most, or I would say the most, iconic city in the world that I'm proud to call home. We are humbled to be a part of this coalition um, and to include New York City as part of our signature program of purpose. After the speakers conclude today, we'll be donating a check for $60,000 to help underwrite the work being done in this beautiful city 
and we invite you to join us for a short Czech presentation. I'd like to give a quick shout out to my colleague from Stonyfield, Mairead Dunphy, who leads the Stonyfields initiative but couldn't be with us today. Um, and I don't want to steal any of the credit for the program that she's grown and evolved. Um, and I'd like to really sincerely thank this coalition of partners, the Black Institute, Beyond Pesticides, or Osborne Organics, the City of New York, um, and everyone who's making this happen for their work um, to you know, bring this important program to life so that New York City, um, all residents can enjoy not just beautiful parks, but parks that are free from pesticides too. So thank you all so much. And I'm going to um, invite up Stop and Jump. <laughs> to say a quick word. Sorry. Sorry, I know uh, she was supposed to be the last speaker, but I guess I'll say a quick word because I know we've been here for a while. My name's Dan Wolk. I'm the Stop and Shop External Communications Manager here located in New York. And I truly am honored to be here representing Stop and Shop as we donate $5,000 to uh, the Stonyfield Organic Play Free Initiative. Um, it is extremely important that our children and all neighbors have organic playgrounds where they can play, which we have heard today, where they can hold picnics, they can walk, and not worry about these pesticides. At Stop and Shop, we believe strongly that we must all do our part to keep out uh, waste from our landfills and support environmental, sustainable programs, not only for the children of today, but for future generations. Um, we are extremely proud to partner with Stonyfield and all the, all the organizations here as our $5,000 will be going to Staten Island where we have five sto stores um, and it'll be going to their Parks and Rec department to support the playgrounds there. So I just want to say thank you for having me, thank you for your patience and at Stop and Shop we are here to serve our customers but not just them, we are also here to serve our community members across New York City so thank you for having me. The Superman from the supermarket. Okay? Stop and shop. Y'all got to stop there. And when you stop there, you got to shop there. So thank you all for coming. You know, you can congratulate us. Uh, Echo Friendly Parks for All. We are responsible for this fabulous weather. Yes, you can give us a hand. You're welcome. Wherever Echo Friendly Parks go, um, that's where you have good weather and good parks. I just want to make sure that you all have a picture of our QR code beyond Poison Parks because, as our commissioner says, our parks are no longer poison. Our parks are good and our parks are organic. Do we have any questions from anybody? Anything you'd like to know? Otherwise, free yogurt from Stonyfield and make sure that you go through the cow. Thank you all for coming.
it's way too many days right now. But uh, do you have a timeline? I like when to get it. Um, I, know I think some it. of the partners were asking for it sooner than later, yeah. but I was kind of we're giving a photo. Photos will be allowed today. So yeah, whenever you have it, um, if you get any other version of the know, but yeah, just want to make sure we share it with everybody. Yeah, sure. but, Gotta have the right here. See if I have to 